Geyer, please tell me about the time that OSA called you to the HGB for help with the internet. Okay, this was a little bit more than 10 years ago. I was called up into the conference room, or the, the main first room in uh, the 11th floor at OSINT. Uh, and I've been there a few times before, so they had the little uh, plastic uh, bear with uh, honey ready and the cookies and everything. Because now I was coming, I was uh, very internet savvy, I was computer savvy, which they knew. And they wanted me uh, my advice regarding some uh, big trouble they had with Google and other stuff on the internet. So um, in there was uh, the, the, one of the, the, the commanders, uh, Kurt Weiland was there, he was the, the commanding officer for CEO, the CEO for OSINT. And his junior, Veronique Bromberg, Aaron Mason was there, he was the public relations officer international. And Gloria Ada was there, uh, she was the webmaster for Scientology International. So these are the people who are in charge of the internet, or handling problems on the internet for the church? Yeah, they are the main executives, the people that uh, get all the flack, handles the shit, uh, tries to make uh, Scientology look good on the internet, and remove all the bad-mouthing and the black PR, as they call it, regarding Scientology on the internet. So you had mentioned that they had spoken with actually one of the founders of Google, for help. Yeah, they had met Sergey um, Brini at uh, a conference and the Gloria Ida tried to convince him that uh, whenever people searched for Scientology they should get good results on Scientology and only if they search for bad Scientology or Scientology critical or critical Scientology or some negative word regarding Scientology only then should they get search results that were negative towards Scientology. So Scientology actually expected Google to change their algorithms to accommodate Scientology's PR needs. Yeah, and, and in the same fell swoop they would uh, uh, make it so that if you search for apples, this is her words, you would only get good results for apples, but if you search for bad apples, then and only then should you be shown search results regarding bad apples. So this was her whole philosophy on how to handle Scientology's bad PR on the net. That's very unrealistic, but what did Google say? Well, they just waved her off and <laughs> didn't really think that was a very good idea, obviously. And she then turned to me and asked, uh, how can we implement this strategy? How can I help them make this real? And I told her that, well, uh, that's not going to happen. So, so she, she met sort of a dead end there, but they used me for other stuff as well. Um, regarding other parts of the strategy because they had a huge fight with the EFF all since they uh, tried to kill ARS, Ultra Religion Scientology, the uh, Usenet group and since they shut down the Anon.fi which was an anonymous remailer, email remailer um, they managed to shut that down and that aggravated EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, the main organization on the internet uh, uh, taking care of personal rights and uh, right for anonymity and civil rights really on the internet. So they became really hostile towards Scientology. So, uh, so Scientology, the Church of Scientology and EFF are in a serious disagreement. They were mortal enemies uh, through you know the, the later part of the 1990s and EFF every time Scientology came up they would say you know bad things about Scientology uh, correctly really and Scientology was the adverse effect of that. They, so, uh, they OSA, were enemies. Yeah, OSA asked you, how do we fix these complaints from uh, EFF online? Yeah, how, did we, how can we fix the fact that they badmouth Scientology all over the internet and aggravate people and uh, make us look like we are the bad guys and that we're against free speech and that we are, you know, against civil rights on the internet and all of that, which they are and they were, um, but uh, they called me in and said, you know, how can we fix this? Because in a couple of days, they said, we are going into a meeting to try to bury the hatchet between EFF and Scientology. And uh, I said, okay, if I, if I should help you, I need a whole day with you. So I was having a whole day with, uh, with Aaron Mason specifically and Veronique Bromberg, uh, to, and also some with Kurt Weilen, the, the commanding officer, to educate them on what the EFF was all about, what the internet was all about, and 
Um, the idea of liberties on the internet and uh, free software, open source, the whole, you know, the mindset of the people in EFF. Well, now, th this is very interesting. Uh, just to go back to a little bit of history, L. Ron Hubbard laid out computer policy. Yeah. Did this complicate your efforts to try to help OSA? Well, a little bit, because they had all this, uh, this idea that Hubbard was um, a major computer genius, that he had uh, laid down some policies regarding computers, and, and he was apparently, according to some, also a database guru, because he had made this uh, cross-index database search for his own works, etc., or directed somebody to make it. So he had laid down some policies that made him a big opinion leader regarding computers. So that made it a little bit of an uphill battle to make them understand that they didn't know shit regarding internet. So you're looking at uh, antiquated L. Ron Hubbard policies on computers, yeah. which is fair to say they're older policies, the internet evolves. Would you say that uh, OSA just simply did not understand internet culture or freedom of speech? They had no clue regarding those areas. They were clueless. So they had the idea that without any ID or what the EFF was about or understanding of their ideology, they would go into a meeting with the EFF and I don't know what they expected to do. But I educated them for one day and a couple of days later they went into this meeting and I met with them later that week and they said, uh, because of uh, that day with education and understanding of the internet culture, they were able to actually bury the hatchet between EFF and Scientology. Um, and that was sort of uh, the start of them using me <coughs> as, um, as an advisor regarding complicated issues on the internet. You know, let me ask you this. Xenu.net at that time was a very big active board and still is, but it was emerging as even a bigger threat to them. Did they ever talk to you about Xenu.net? Yeah, we, we covered basically everything regarding uh, critical sites and uh, problematic, you know, Andreas Heldalun, he was uh, a huge, maybe the biggest problem they had on the internet during the whole of the 90s and also in the beginning of the 2000s and maybe later. Um, and we talked about that because one time earlier in 1996, I was uh, charged with the task from OSA Europe to infiltrate Andreas. Really? What, what did they want, how did they want you to handle Andreas? They wanted me to get in touch with him and find his weak spots and his crimes because they told me straight out that he was probably a pedophile, um, obviously since he was so critical. And uh, he wanted me to, they wanted me to find that out, you know, discover his crimes, sexual crimes preferably. So I portrayed this, uh, this woman that has been, uh, been brutalized by the, the Jehovah's Witness to get into his, uh, you know... To try to play on Andreas' sympathies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, that exchange went on for three or four times and uh, then he dropped off the radar so I probably fucked up, so... But anyway, uh, yeah. th that was my earliest uh, assignment for OSA, trying to do something effective in the, as an OSA helper. That was 1996. After handling uh, EFF, what was your next assignment? There were several stuff that they talked to me about and uh, how to handle the strategy regarding, uh, you know, all the, the negative stuff on the internet and uh, the Google rankings came up again and uh, there were many things. But I remember in 2009, uh, just a couple of months before I left the church, there was a guy called Ingo who called from Osaint and said, we have this huge problem regarding Wikipedia. Because Scientology were banned from editing the article on Scientology or any related articles on Scientology. And they were, uh, you know, sort of, they couldn't do anything about their image, their PR. And Ingo was really up to his ears with trouble in this. And his, his seniors, Gloria Ida specifically, had asked him to call me to say, you know, Guy could probably help us on this shit. He knows Wikipedia, he knows open source, he knows the internet. So he called me and it said, what should we do about this? So they, yeah, they, I recall they were trying to change the Wikipedia entry on them. Yeah, they, they tried to, actually they tried to do advertising on Wikipedia and that was what shut them down. And they were given fair warnings and they still continued doing it. And then they were barred from editing the articles. Hey, tell me about the suggestion or plan you gave them to address the Wikipedia problem. Yeah, I, I said, you know, you're probably not going to like this, I told Ingo, uh, but what you need to do is first of all, you openly admit that you screwed up. You say we violated Wikipedia policy, 
we screwed up. And then you need to uh, issue a public apology and saying, okay, flat out, we screwed up. And after that, you need to implement or create first a course for every person in Scientology that is going to edit anything in Wikipedia. You create a course for them to study so that they will actually abide by the policies of Wikipedia. And you will pay the Wikimedia Wiki board, uh, the board to create this course together with them. You create it so that it's open source under the free documentation license or the Creative Commons license uh, so that every corporation that has people editing articles can make use of the same course. You donate this course to the world and then also you make sure that uh, this board is able to audit you every year so that they can see that you comply by the policies. And then you pay them to do that too. So that you make sure that you make all the amends in full public view. That will handle it. So this plan failed spectacularly. They rejected it. Well, Ingo just laughed and said, yeah, that will be the day. Yeah. <laughs> in, in corporate PR management, general policy in a disaster is to issue an apology, to say that you understand the problem and it won't happen again. Yeah, and implement steps that make sure that it won't happen again. They have hired a PR expert, uh, Michael Citrick. He's one of the top PR crisis managers in the world, who apparently has not helped them handle their PR crisis. Their goal, as I understand it, is to stop all in theta online. Is How do they propose to do that? Uh, my proposition to do that is, uh, first of all, you stop lying. You admit to every lie that you did. Uh, you make it totally transparent so that every time you go out and say something, it's fact-checked. Um, but the problem is Scientology cannot admit to wrongness and cannot stop lying because there are root problems there that cannot be addressed by the staff in OSA because it would be a violation of LRH policy if they stopped lying. There's stuff there you need to lie about. It, it is odd that the fundamental principle of the church is that it lies as a principle of its, of its existence. It must. It knows it's lying and it must lie. Yeah, I can tell you an example. Please. Obviously when um, somebody asks a church official about Xenu, the Galactic Emperor, you know, the, yes. the, the story about 75 million years ago, etc. The person that answers must lie because it must remain confidential. What everybody outside of the church knows already must remain confidential. So the person is put in a position where he has to lie. So we saw Tommy Davis lie about Xenu. Yeah, we saw Michael Ingram lie when he was in about Xenu. We have seen, you know, all people put on the mic, you know, what, who, who is Xenu? We see them lie, of course we do. Well, even now with uh, Marty Rathbun, they have lied and said that he was never an important church official, that he was a nobody, and yet, in the Luis Garcia lawsuit, he's suddenly very important church official who cannot be possibly involved in this case. Why the non-stop lies? Why, what LRH policies makes them lie all the time about almost everything? It's not only one single policy, because you can always pull out a policy that covers anything in Scientology. LRH also said never use lies in PR, but it's the whole idea that Scientology is the most important thing in the universe. It is the only thing that can save the universe. So if it is, let's say it was, it is the most important thing that ever, ever emerged. For the right? sake of argument, yes. For the sake of argument. Now, nothing could be more important. Therefore, lying is, is, is you can get away with lying, you can get away potentially with murder to save Scientology. Anything to save Scientology would be okay in the book of LRH. You have a contempt and also LRH says specifically in keeping Scientology working number one that a group has only their reactive mind, their bank, their aberrations, their insanities in common. So a group, the ultimate group on the planet Earth is the Internet. So that is the ultimate bank agreement, the ultimate insanity in common. So therefore, OSA Int has this idea that, yeah, the internet is sort of a group agreement, common insanity, it's, it's a snake pit. 
So it's us against them, and we are superior. So their view of the internet is very distorted, that they think it's an insane activity and they have to impose order on it by putting in an acceptable truth or a lie. A lie, acceptable truth, putting in ethics on the planet, you know, making people behave, making people more sane, more rational, if not by auditing and the counseling, then by ethics and force. So even, even though the internet will find your lies and expose them ruthlessly, mm -hmm. because it's interested in the truth, yeah. the church will continue to lie. Does it have contempt for non-scientologists? They do. Um, first of all is this idea about the homo novus and we are superior, etc. It's, it's a classical cult thing. You're inside the elite group and therefore the others on the outside are less you know, important or less valuable than they're, yourself. They're wogs. They're wogs, yeah. A, a classical thing. I, I did a blog post on that regarding labels and Scientology is very good at putting labels on people. SP, PTS, you can, you can look this up. Geyer, you're an OT8. You're in the church in 2008. Suddenly, out of the blue, Anonymous shows up. This has got to be the church's worst nightmare. What happened? That was a very interesting moment for me because I, I was already on the board of directors of the EFN, the Norwegian counterpart to the Electronic Frontier Foundation since 2005. I was in open source, uh, running an open source company and run a couple of open source companies. And I was very much a copyright abolitionist. I want to remove copyright from the face of the earth, I still do, and that's one of my passions, and also remove patents from the face of the earth. So I thought Anonymous was a very, very interesting motion. It was like, wow, this is happening, this is really cool. Uh, and then I was struggling with myself because I, I was not allowed to think that was cool. That should be very uncool <laughs> if you're an OT8. So I was talking to the OSA regarding this, I was trying to hold back my excitement that this thing is happening because it's a civil liberty movement, a new, of a new kind of movement that only the internet could provide. And they were all, you know, flustered and running around and being all kind of emergency, you know, it's like, what the hell do we do? And I had a plan for them. So I proposed a plan for OSA. What was the plan? On how to handle Anonymous. I think it could have been successful, but I, I'm very glad it, it didn't run out uh, or run, run its course. Um, I said, you know, you need to infiltrate Anonymous and make them attack another thing that is more worthwhile, that is bigger, that is more juicy. It could be China, it could be, you know, uh, liberation of Tibet, it could be Iran, which they later did. Yes. But Anonymous did that on their own accord, so I'm sure Scientology was not involved in that, but I proposed that type of activity to move the flock of sparrows, uh, the, you know, the ant hill, to another place. But did, did, did you not, uh, Scientology did not understand the concept of lulls. No, that they did you, not. That if you, part of the reason Anonymous did it, because it was a justice action, mm -hmm. it was exposing a criminal cult. Yeah. The other part of it was just plain fun to poke this monster and have it growl back. I thought actually that was the coolest part, by the way. It was very fun. <laughs> yeah. I was not a member of Anonymous, but I did protest. Yeah. I did join them in the protest because I believed it was very important action. Yeah. And they were OT handlers who were exposed to the upper level materials. Yeah. Part of it was to put Xenu online and to let the people know about Xenu and the whole Scientology cosmology. Mm -hmm. Did that bother you as an OT8? <sighs> Did it bother me? Mm. It, uh, I was struggling inside regarding that, and, and I have been for a long time. Ever since I went on the board of directors at EFN in 2005, I had this you know, struggling inside. Should, should the freedom of information trump the fact of secrecy of the OT levels? I was still much into the, it must be secret, it must be confidential. But after I went out from the church in 2009, I started really re-evaluate that part in me. And I guess in 2011 or so, I said, okay, fuck it, this is, I, I can't live with this cognitive dissonance between it must be secret, but information freedom is more important. So freedom of information won over me. And then I published all the OT levels and everything on the internet because I think it's important for everybody to know what is there. But it was a struggle in 2008. I, I really have to admit that. I understand stuff. that. It, it, it is hard. And we were talking earlier, Scientology tried to use copyright law 
yeah. has tried to use copyright law to enforce secrecy of its upper levels. Tell me about your conversation with OSA about why they shouldn't use copyright law, why they should look for another solution. I was sitting there in one of my meetings uh, in LA uh, with Gloria Ada and Veronique Bromberg uh, discussing this problem. I, I actually brought up the problem and said, you know, you are in a, in a position where you don't want to be. You're using copyright law to protect the OT level uh, secrecy, the confidentiality of this material. And the way you do that puts you straight into the same category as McDonald's and Coca-Cola and Microsoft. You are then a business because you use this business law. So you shouldn't do that. You should instead lobby for a religious law that protects secret religious scriptures. I said, that's much better. Otherwise, you will be treated in public view as a corporation, which they are, but yeah. They are, so that put you probably in conflict with their management. They believe very much in suing people. Yeah. And the spectacular failure of the church to handle anonymous was in many ways a victory for open source documentation. Yeah. Do you know the church's current position? The OT levels are all over the internet. They're obviously, it's, they're overwhelmed, they can't go after it. Given that, what did the church decide to do once they realized they couldn't handle anonymous or the OT levels? Did they capitulate? I, locally, they capitulated. Locally, every OSA in every org uh, became sort of, okay, we just report what happens and send it uplines and hope somebody will handle something. But still, they are, the manpower uplines at OSA, etc., has been you know, under pressure. So the pressure is mounting up, they have less people, they are driven into apathy and they get desperate, they do desperate actions. They go after Marty with the squirrel busters, they are spread out thin. For them to do anything about the confidentiality of the OT materials now is just, it's, it's 10 years ago since they had any power in that area. Geyer, it's uh, 2006, you're on the free winds, what happened? Well, in 2006 in June, early June, I completed OT8. I went back home for two weeks and then I was invited and I was supposed to be on the maiden voyage that year. Uh, so I went to the maiden voyage and there was uh, David Miscavige, of course. It was a huge David Miscavige show. And on the fourth night of all the events, there was a photo shoot with David Miscavige. So every group was to go into the Heritage restaurant and do a photo shoot together with David Miscavige. I was standing there together with uh, two Swedish uh, OT8s. I was the only OT8 from Norway. I am still the only person living in Norway that is OT8. And they were joking and said, we should be the Scandinavian crew. And then I said, have you heard about 1905? That was when the union between Sweden and Norway split up. So I'm my own country. You can go in and be Sweden. And then um, the ED, the executive director of Stockholm Org, and uh, his wife, the, his junior, said, we have taken on the responsibility of being the management of Sweden, you know, the Stockholm Org. So you should be the new ED of Oslo Org. I will mention that to David Miscavige, he said. I said, don't, don't do that. And then he walked in, did the photo shoot, and then it was my turn. Lots of security, lots of people with much brass and everything. I came into the room, and all of a sudden I heard this voice saying, where's the guy from Oslo? And this little guy came walking, and that was David Miscavige, and I said, here, sir. And then he put out his hand and said, so you're the next ED of Oslo War, congratulations! And what did you say? I went, no, sir, I'm not. And then people around him went like, oops, he said no to David Miscarriage, to COB. And then he said, but what could be a better game? And then I really fucked up. I said, well, I can think of a few. <laughs> you said that? <laughs> yeah. And everybody went like, looking down and trying to remove themselves, you know, beam me up, Scotty. So you've been, this is somewhat of a social faux pas in front of COB. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah and yeah, people yeah. are looking aghast at you. Yeah. What thinking, happened? What the hell is this guy doing? Is what is he doing? And then he just went on and said, you know, you got to be the ED. you got to be the new ED. You're the opinion leader of Norway. And then he turned around to his juniors and said, we hear nothing about Norway. We don't know anything about what's happening in Oslo, do we? And they went, no, 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 we don't, sir. We don't, we don't. So I was standing there and he was trying to, was almost starting to 
you know, bickering with me, quarreling uh, about me being the ED of Oslo Org. And when he saw that that wouldn't go anywhere, in the middle of a sentence, he just turned around and walked out of the room. He left. Yeah, in the middle of a sentence. Just 180 degrees and straight out the room. And then you're there in the room. I, I was standing there and everybody was, you know, befuddled and flabbergasted and just looking and not knowing what to do and uh, do, do, do you want something to drink and all of that. And I was standing there thinking, where's the hidden camera? This is the most silly thing I've seen. And mind you, I was running a recruitment company for 10 years, from 1990 to 2000, a wise company called U-Man. So I've been recruiting north of 2,000 people for various companies. And this must be the worst recruitment cycle I've ever, ever seen. Here is a guy that whispers in the ear of the commander of the whole church that the guy out there in the corridor, the next guy to come in, should be taking over his church in Oslo. He know nothing about me, and he admitted he know nothing about Oslo. So right here and now, he was now bypassing 15 people on the command channel to put me on post, who he does not know who is, and sack a person in Oslo, the current ED, who he knows nothing about. Is this typical in the Church of Scientology? It is, but the point is, ever since I started in Scientology in 1984, that was 25 years earlier, I had seen a lot of shit happening. I've been screamed to, I've been spit in the face, as a public, I've seen shit, right? You were spit, someone spit at you in the yeah, face? Yeah, the ED of Oslo work spit me in the face. Yeah, crazy shit. Now, uh, I've seen stuff, but I always chalk that up to local insanity. My whole justification all through those 25 years was this shit is a local problem. Up there at the top, where David Miscavige and all the seniors are residing, they are like, in my view, they must be Dalai Lama trying to handle the problems of the juniors, the subordinates, who are untrained, unwilling, and just plain rude. When I met David Miscavige and this scene happened, all of a sudden it dawned on me. It's not local problems that the, the, the saints and the top tries to handle. This is the problem originating from the top and trickling down to the local insanity that I see. This was my epiphany, standing there and thinking, holy crap, what happened? This, this is just insanity. This is when you began to doubt. That was my point of doubt. That's where it started. That's where it really started. I have my small doubts here and there, but this is where it went south. So, I went a year, reading a little bit on the internet, but didn't have much time but what, because I was engaged in many other things. But from 2007 to 2009, I spent about a thousand hours reading everything I could. Yep. I had been reading a lot before as an OSA operative helper, but now I was reading for my own enlightenment on what the hell was going on. Who are you reading? Give me examples of some people you were reading. I, I was mainly interested in stuff that happened at the top since I met David Miscavige, since I had also met a lot of the top executives like Ray Mithoff, Mark Yeager, Guillaume Lesev, uh, Norman Starkey and uh, Mike Rinder, etc. when they were senior position people in the church. So I was reading stuff from uh, Little Bear Victor, I was reading from Jay Swift, I was reading from um, uh, you know, Mark Headley, Blown for Good, and, and also BTs to Free. Um, so the, all, these, uh, all these writers, uh, Mark Headley, John Peeler, yeah. Little Bear Victor, others were leaking astonishing stories of what was happening at Int Base, the cruelty. Exactly, and especially stuff like David Miscavige hitting people. I could see that be true, as I've seen his insanity up close, and he was like wild-eyed, pretty, you know, insane. So. That rang true with me, and also stuff like the, the musical chairs happening at Int Base, and, and many of the other atrocities happening. Guy, one of the most famous stories is Mark Headley's musical chairs. Yeah, when I is. first read that on Xenu.net, I was shocked, I was stunned. I knew that there was insanity at the top of the church, yeah. but that just was astonishing for the cruelty. It was shocking. It was. Prior to Anonymous, I think it was one of the biggest things that ever happened on the critics' boards. I would agree. What was your reaction to musical chairs as an OT? Um, you know, there are several things that made me end up going out of the church in 2009, in August. Uh, that was a major factor. 
the biggest factor was David Miscavige, as I told you about. And then it was the musical chairs and all the accounts of David Miscavige hitting people and, uh, and other stuff happening, like, you know, uh, David Miscavige throwing himself uh, over the table and then uh, taking on uh, Jeff Hawkins. Um, and, and that, his story, also rang true. And, uh, and so many accounts, and all that together uh, culminated in me writing my six-page write-up, and this is why I leave the church. And it's an outstanding write-up. I, I, I'm very glad that you wrote it, as are so many other people. When you left the church, what were the immediate consequences? Um, I decided to rule my own scenario. So what I did was I uh, went into meetings with 25 Scientologists in Norway, gave them the write-up, and said, please read this, and if you have any questions, ask me. Because I knew the church would want to run the scenario and make me look you know, insane or find some dirt on me or invent something or whatever. So I was doing this to my friends and making them um, in the position where they can actually ask me, well, what, why do I think what I write? And then I went to the media. I went straight to a, a classmate I had uh, who was working for the national TV station of Norway and said, I have a story for you. So I went on national TV on a Saturday, seven minute piece, talking about this. That was one or two weeks after I went out. And after that, it would be very, very difficult for the church to paint another story about me because the truth has already been put out there. Then they sent an OSA handler, Kirsten Kitano, to Norway to meet with me. What happened? Uh, I was actually meeting with a friend of mine, another OT8. Uh, and uh, we were supposed to have a nice meeting in a cafe, and all of a sudden there was this girl sitting there. Kirsten uh, Catano had yeah. flown over. Yeah, and I asked her, so, so, who are you? And she said, my name is Kirsten, Kirsten Catano, from, from OSA, EU or INT? INT. And I said, so you came all over here to just talk to me? And what her response was was really hilarious. She said, well, I just happened to be in the neighborhood. <laughs> like neighborhood of what Santa Claus and reindeer? It's just crazy <laughs> shit. So and and then I decided, okay, I'll just walk over and get myself a coffee while I put on the recorder. So I recorded the whole thing and it went on for two and a half hours. It started in the restaurant and she said, We have some data for you, we would like you to read. Uh-huh, give it to me. No, it's in a hotel room. Okay. So we walked for you know 10-15 minutes to a hotel room rigged up already, and in there come also Annette Refstrup, who is the, the, the head of OSA in EU. And she was then the book carrier, apparently, because she carried all these books with, you know, affidavits for, for all the people on the end and shit, slinging shit on the Mike Rinder, Marta Rathbun, etc. So I was sitting there reading all this stuff they wanted to co me to, to buy, to convince me that I should not be a critic. Were they trying to silence you? Did they want you back in the church, or did they just want to silence you on the internet? Originally in the meeting, it, it became obvious to me that they wanted me back. When they understood that that wouldn't happen, they tried to silence me and make me understand that uh, you should at least not say anything bad. Did they threaten to expose any of your data in your confessional folders? Well, I don't have any much shit there, so it wouldn't be of much use to try to expose anything. So, I don't they know. Didn't, they didn't play no. that card. No. Because yeah. they knew that, well, what, what is there to expose? I haven't been, you know, fucking around or doing shit, so it's, it's not a big deal. So, but they were trying, so then they were just trying to persuade you that you were, you had false information. Exactly, exactly. And, and that yeah. Marty Rathbun and Mike Winder was dirtbags and they were, you know, just full of lies and I shouldn't believe them, etc. What do you think of David Miscavige now? I think he's a creative genius. Really? Explain. I'll tell you why. Because Scientology as a subject touts itself as complete. It's a complete bridge to total freedom. And it's consistent. Nothing can be complete and consistent. You can look at that up with Gödel's incompleteness theorems, but take it for what yes, I'm saying I now. Understand. Nothing can be complete and consistent. And LRH Hubbard even writes that nothing can remain the same. Things will change, which is a truism in this world, that the, the world is always changing, the universe is changing, nothing will remain the same. So either things expand or they contract. Yes. If you don't change or adopt or modify or improve upon stuff, 
it will slowly and gradually erode and corrode into nothingness. It must evolve or die. Exactly, it must evolve or die. And Elrich covers this in his Conditions of Existence. Now, Scientology is a subject set in stone. When Hubbard died, it cannot be changed. It cannot be improved upon. It cannot be modified, molded, or done anything with. It's set in stone. So David Miscavige has this subject. He inherited the command of this subject that is set in stone that will eventually corrode and die. So how the hell does a person then con extract more money? Well, he has to repackage. Well, this leads to another question. Do you believe that David Miscavige is a true believer, that he is actually a true hardcore Scientologist? I do. I do believe that. This is what I saw in his eyes. So I think he is, he's charged himself with this, this task of making Scientology work, make it take over the world, make LRH's vision come true through this methodology. But it will corrode and die. So he is superficially keeping it alive, by repackaging, selling, repackaging, selling, repackaging, and selling. He's done that for how many years now? 30 years. And I don't know of any person on planet Earth that has done the same task so successfully, extracting billions of dollars since that time, with a subject that you cannot change, you cannot modify, you cannot improve it. I don't know anybody that has done that. So I call this guy a, a creative genius for being able to do that so successfully. Why do Scientologists continue to purchase libraries if it's repackaged, resold? Why do they obediently continue to purchase re-released products? First of all, because it is, he finds something wrong. Not that LRH did, but some transcribers or some other people that did something wrong, and he is the savior of this technology, of this material, so he corrects it. And he corrects the little parts, so that it makes it even better in stone. And then you buy it again, and then you buy it again, and then you repackage, and then you buy. So it's a repackaging thing, and that is the genius of him, being able to extort this money again and again from the same parishioners. Okay, but over against him reselling, making a lot of money in a genius way, Scientology as a church is in a death spiral. It is, but, uh, but I think he, uh, putting myself in his frame of mind, yeah. this is just speculation of course, would be something like, it must work because Elred says it works. So, if, there is, if it's not working, it's either because of errors in the material that I take on the task of handling, or it is because you have suppressive people in the organizations making the whole thing not go up, making it go down. So, here comes the witch hunt. Like in Oslo Org. I've been witnessing witch hunts for 20-30 years. The stat statistics won't go up. And we are seeing events upon events every year, multiple events, where we can see that the statistics are growing up, the expansion is happening everywhere else, but not in Oslo. And I suspect everyone in every org in the whole world are thinking the same. We see the statistics, the expansion going up, but not here. So we're thinking, what the hell are we doing wrong? There must be a suppressive person among our ranks. We must find the witch. And we must kill her. We must drown her. And then they drown one, and then the second, and then the third, and the statistics still won't go up, and the witch hunt continues. And so they're in a, the church is in a perverse pattern whereby they claim to fix transcription errors, mm -hmm. find lost tech, mm -hmm. promise superpower that never comes, mm -hmm. and also destroying SPs. Yeah. And since the technology, the works of LRH, is infallible, it cannot be wrong, People must be wrong. So you shoot one, two, three, four, five. You shoot the people that has been there long, longest because the statistic has not gone up since the 80s in Oslo. So therefore there must be somebody since the 80s. And those guys who have been there the longest are usually the most competent because they have the most skills, the most experience, and then you start shooting them. And then it just goes into a nosedive and the desperation continues and it becomes more and more of a horrible situation and we must find the next SP. Goes it goes faster and faster and faster. So coincident to this finding of SPs, shattering, and look, shattering suppression, getting rid of people, there's events six times a year where they sell things. Yeah. And it's sort of a soulless, bizarre parade where they're getting rid of SPs and selling stuff. To fewer and fewer people. And costing more and more. 
And in the meantime, the internet's exposing their lies every day. So this, yeah. is, not a, this is not an ideal situation. It will die. The, the Church of Scientology will be wiped out. It will not wiped out in a big fell swoop, but it will corrode. And major contributors to that is David Miscavige. Uh, because, not really David Miscavige, he's holding it up, but he, he cannot hold it up for, for too long. Even he will tire out and the parishioners will go elsewhere and he will make it, you know, he will know style too. And uh, you have stuff like Anonymous that we covered, it's a major contributor, and the internet in general contributes to showing what a complete lie this is. It is a thing, a body of knowledge, that will eventually die. Indeed, I, my position has always been, spiritually speaking, karmically speaking, that the Church of Scientology is being dismantled in its present form. It is. What do you think will happen to David Miscavige? Will he retire, die in office? I don't think it will go that far. No? <laughs> I, th I, I, think, um, I think somebody somewhere will find something on him that will stick with the FBI and he will be prosecuted. That is my guess. A few years from now maybe, we didn't see this coming, but all of a sudden this shit happens and he will be put into the stand and he will somehow fuck up and he will end in jail. That's what I think. And mind you, then we might have a serious situation because I don't think there is anybody left that can run the church. And I don't think there is anybody left that would want to run the church. And some people have so much vested interest in him personally, as a leader, as a father figure, that we might even have suicides on our hands, if that happens. Well, that's certainly one scenario that's been discussed online. Yeah. Uh, you're not alone in thinking that. Do you think that if a big legal action happens, it would be possible for a committee to step in to take over the church, or is it too far gone? It's too far gone. So there's no OT committee or OT management experts who step in and take over? I don't think so. What do you think happens, uh, just for the sake of discussing, if Miscavige is gone, what happens the day after he's gone? I think it was, will be a, a forking, a branching, a stuff popping up here and there, a church is going independent wholesale, uh, formation of groups of churches, former churches of, you know, Japan or whatever, uh, bonding together in loosely knit or tightly knit organizational structures. Uh, I think we will see, uh, you know, a sort of an anarchy and then arising several organizations trying to cope. And some of them will be successful because they start adopting, changing and evolving the material. If they don't, they're into the same situation, it will corrode, and it will die. Geyer, what would you say to Scientologists, and especially OTs, who are still in the church? For those who are still in the church, like I was pre-2006, 2007, before I started to educate myself, I would give the advice that, dear OT, you have a responsibility to inform yourself to educate yourself, to know what is going on with management, with the technology that has helped you a lot. And you need to inform yourself to the point where you can make a rational decision that you can stand by. You need to take 100% responsibility for your own situation, for your own knowledge and for the decision that you make. Because you will look back at this in years to come and thinking, why the hell didn't I do something about the situation? Why did I condone by tacit, you know, not saying anything about the situations that I see? You need to get yourself informed. Now, you should also realize that the reason people come into Scientology is because they want to better themselves or they want to better others or the situation around them, the world or whatever. That is what they want to achieve. That goal, that ideal is more important than how or you know, the technology you use or whatever. The fact that you want to improve something, that should be the ideal that you strive for. If you see there is a broken church that will not get you there, then you need to handle it. You need to make some kind of a decision for yourself. And I walked out. 
if you want to make a mutiny, if you want to take charge of your organization, if you want to liberate that organization and make it an independent organization, there's a host of different things you can do. You can walk out uh, in silence and start your auditing outside, your counseling outside, your training outside. There's more training and auditing probably done on the outside of the church than inside. So there is a lot of possibilities. But to make the right decision for you, you need the knowledge and information. And as they say in X-Files, the truth is out there. What does it mean to be an OT? <laughs> what does it mean to be an OT? Yes, what does it mean to be an OT? To me it means virtually nothing. I'll tell you why. Because being something does not mean much to me. Uh, doing what is right for me to others and with others, it is that what matters. I don't have any idea about altitude or being better or any such thing, and I hated that part in the church. When I went to Russia, people were, you know, oh, I touched him, I sat with him on the lunch table, and that kind of crap. I hated that part. So, um, to be OT? No, I don't have anything on that. It's, it's an identity, it's a spiritual identity people assume. But it's also, a, it seems to me, it's become a status-obsessed church. I agree. And that OT8 is a status, like an IAS patron. Yeah. Spiritually, would you say that status is meaningless in the church? What are they striving for, other than status? Status is very important in the church because it gives you protection from shit happening. Okay. Uh, the more status you have, like OT8 or you're a trained auditor and you've done this and that, that helps you not get into trouble. But I hate that part of the whole scene. I, I, would, I would rather just break the whole thing down and say, you know, you're on your own spiritual path and there are tools here that can help you. Spiritually, I don't think there is much difference between you and I. I mean, I've, I've done the whole no. bridge, I've done OT8, and you're a very, very spiritual person. Right. And I, I would say I would learn a lot from reading your book and I would learn a lot from just talking to you. And that is how I view every person on the planet. There are people that can teach me a lot, like my kids. My, my, you know, my three kids, when they were like three, four, five years old, I learned a lot from them, from their philosophy about life, etc. And some of that is more than I got out to the OT levels, funny enough. So the whole status thing, I don't like it. Uh, but I see it's there, and it's very a lot of people striving for it to get protection, to be viewed as better, or you know the whole homo novis uh, scene, which is a little bit of like it smacks of Übermensch. Uh, yes, it does. The, the Nazi, yes. the whole ideology, and and it, it's frightening. And that's what many non Scientologists find disturbing is the homo novis idea that they are superior. It's horrible. Can Scientology produce a spiritual master? It's like asking, can the ingredients make a cake? No, it cannot. Um, I don't think anybody can make a spiritual master except yourself, for yourself. Uh, there are tools, there are paths, there are uh, workable ingredients for the cake called spiritual mastery. Scientology it supplies a lot of tools that has helped me a lot. I was a very, very shy guy. I was a nerd. I was uh, socially inept. I wouldn't be able to pick up any girls before I was 18 years old. Uh, I couldn't read aloud in class without hyperventilating and being brought down to the hospital. It was a crazy, shitty scene for me socially. And the communication training helped me uh, overcome that. Me doing the communication training did that not the drills themselves, right? And through my Scientology, uh, 25 years in Scientology, everything I've done, I've had gains from. But that is not, it's not Scientology's responsibility, it's my responsibility, utilizing the tools. But you can find similar tools in Buddhism, in Zen, in, I guess, whatever. Take a hike, go up into the mountains, sit there, watch the stars, buy a telescope, it will do you wonders. Now, all of these things facilitate the person to take responsibility for himself. And every person must find his own true path. And I find, as I said, a lot of true things in Scientology. It helped me a lot. Um, more, some things more than others, especially the communication trainings, OT2, OT5, 6, and 7, uh, and 8. Not for the reason that they say it works, but for my own reason. 
Well, you mentioned words. you mentioned in our conversation last night that you would shorten the bridge. What's your take on condensing Scientology? From my point of view, for me as a person, I would do the communication training, the solo course, OT2, OT5, OT7, OT8, and that's all I needed, really. I had gains from everything else, but this is basically what I needed. Another person might need something else, maybe in the reverse sequence for all that I know, but I would like to, you know, get rid of the whole evaluation, which it re really is. It's a spiritual huge evaluation to say this is the steps you need to do in this sequence because it's all one size fits all. See, That's not true. No, in my experience with, not, uh, with, uh, with Buddhism, with Christianity, and also talking to Scientologists, and I want to see if you would, what you think about the statement, a lot of spiritual paths liberate consciousness. They liberate you from things that are besetting you or troubling you. But then they take that free attention or free consciousness and they convert it to an identity and it makes it worse. This is what happens in Scientology. As you go up the bridge, uh, most people get more liberated. I got more you know, creative power. I started doing uh, music. I started creating artwork. I, I did the stuff that I couldn't even dream of doing before. This happened on OT2. Now, as this happened, I got more liberated, yes. But at the same time, the demands came down the command channel on how to uh, be, how to do, what to do, what not to do, how to behave, the whole program of the OT ambassador. This is what you should do every day, every, you know, every waking hour. All of that transforms that freedom into an identity, and that identity becomes a slave for the church management. So would you say this is the the dilemma of Scientology, you can get spiritual liberation through the technology, but on the other hand you're being saddled with an identity yeah. that does not give you free will. Exactly. It gives you free will and takes it away. So this is a, a bait and switch. Thing. A dilemma that results in cognitive dissonance. It does. You're OT8 and yet you must obey, you must be, you must do. And you must start lying because every time you get a cough or, or you, you know, something happens to you, you must shield it because you're an OT8. And anything that comes out, oh, the guy is sick. He can't be sick, he's OT8. Therefore, you must start lying. You must hide yourself whenever it's something wrong. If you're depressed one day, you got to put on a smiley face. Not because you need to put on a smiley face, because you don't want Scientologist PR to be damaged. Well, this is one of the things I, that... I, OTs talk about they feel they have the burden of carrying the entire subject and guarding the honor of the church. So they can't communicate any sort of human emotion, feeling that's not appropriate to church PR. That is true, and this is what helped me with my blogging. Because as I blog, as I release freely my own thoughts into the internet, um, I become free of that identity where to the point I'm no longer a Scientologist, I'm not an independent Scientologist, and don't give a flying shit about the technology really, except it's a bunch of tools that might help people just as any other bunch of tools. So people must find their own path. I found mine, I'm working on my own path further than Scientology. I will do more stuff in Scientology, also because it's a, it's a pool of tools for me. But the identity of a Scientologist, no, I don't want it. I don't want any such forced identity. Well, that's one of the, the, the uh, work you do in Buddhism or in Zen is to be free of all identities, to be consciousness, yes. to be liberated. Yes. Having said that, would you do Scientology all over again? If I were back in 1984, with the knowledge I now have about what would happen, I would do it all again. Well, Just sure. because it worked for me. But I, that does not mean I would necessarily say it would work for another or that they should do what I did. I wouldn't say that. I, I can only say what I know to be true for myself. Do you have regrets? Not anymore. I'm, I'm done with the shame, blame and regret games in life. So I, I, I tend to start you know, looking forward always. If something happened, I crashed the car, it's like, okay, the car is crashed, what now? My arm is ripped off, what now? So that is, that is my whole modus operandi, really.